Good afternoon. It is my pleasure to welcome you to this year's D.W. Brooks Lecture. Uh, I know we have a, a good crowd here locally, but we'll also be having those that will be joining us remotely around the state for what is, in my opinion, one of the most exciting days in the life of our college. My name is Sam Pardew. I'm the Dean of the College of Agricultural and Environmental Sciences. Uh, I, I'm pleased to be here. That I get to wear a boutonniere today and I don't have to pay for a wedding. So um, <laughs> that is an exciting thing. Uh, today we uh, will enjoy what promises to be a thought-provoking lecture as well as that we will honor some outstanding faculty and staff who carry on the legacy that was established by D.W. Brooks, a, a man who in a very real sense laid the foundation for much of the work that we do today in the college. D.W. Brooks has the distinction of being both the youngest and the oldest faculty member in our college. He began teaching in the, in, in the college at the age of 19, and he returned after a long career in agriculture and served as a visiting professor until his death at the age of 97. So I won't ask for a show of hands of anybody who has a longer tenure than than D.W. did. He truly dedicated his entire life to this college and into improving agriculture. For those of you who may not be familiar with his impact, let's take a moment to learn more about his legacy and the great example that he made for us all. The whole idea in the farmer was that I could bring them all up. <laughs> and I wanted to get them to where they were the, the greatest producers and, and the highest income group. I wanted to take them from the bottom to the top if I could. He would say, never forget who causes things to happen the workers in the field who harvest the crops, who plant the crops. I grew up understanding that farmers were the absolute rock bottom supporters of our culture. One of the stories that really had a great impact on him was uh, what he would tell about his mother back when he was growing up on the farm in Georgia, here a cotton farm. And his mother would always say, said, you don't feed people because they're good or feed them because they're bad. You feed people because they're hungry. He saw the great need for something to happen in agriculture. He was a faculty member at the University of Georgia. And uh, admittedly, I think he left that against the better wishes of the Dean of Agriculture at the University and his own father uh, to try to do something to benefit the farmers of Georgia. The average money that crossed a farmer's hand in a year was $72. He had been to Denmark early in his life and had seen the co-ops there. And he came back and started what was cotton producers, which became Goldkist. The purpose of Goldkist, as Mr. Brooks often articulated, it was to improve the economic well-being of family farmers in the areas it served. Goldkist was one of the first companies that had poultry servicemen, whose total function was to go around from farm to farm and help the producers do a better job at what they were doing. He was absolutely committed to the fact that profits were to be shared and that's how it happened in a, a, a co-op. Goldkiss legacy in Georgia is that many, many farm families achieved a much higher uh, standard of living and their sons and daughters and grandsons and granddaughters continue to enjoy that benefit today through the poultry business. Mr. Brooks influenced agriculture policy very directly. Because Goldkist was the largest agribusiness in the Southeast, he knew presidents and secretaries of agriculture, secretaries of commerce, other cabinet members. 
and he served on boards for many presidents, for seven presidents. One of the most compelling speeches I heard President Carter make was at Mr. Brooks's 85th birthday celebration at Gold Kiss. He gave him the credit that he deserved for the leadership that he provided to Gold Kiss, to Emory, to the Methodist Church, and to agribusiness in the Southeast. He loved the university, and that was the only way it was ever referred to in our house. It was the university. When he was in his 90s, he was invited back to give lectures in the School of Agriculture. He loved being able to brag that he had been the youngest professor and now the oldest. One of the things that is so nice about the D.W. Brooks Lecture is that it is an ongoing educational commitment. I think the importance of the Brooks Lecture today is that it brings the leading thinkers, the leading speakers, the, the, the thought leaders, to the campus so that, that young people can see that there are great opportunities in agriculture, agribusiness, agricultural economics, and the environment associated with agricultural activities. He would be absolutely thrilled about, and he was thrilled about it during his lifetime when he could go. That was one of the highlights of the year. Today the South is booming, it's doing well, and it's up there even now, and it's, uh, we're doing quite well. So we, uh, we have great uh, institutions now in the South, and they're training uh, lots of wonderful people, and they're building the South, and it, uh, that's the way you do it. And, uh, and so I think the future of the South looks better to me every day. Brooks's reference to the university, and perhaps we ought to all continue to refer to UGA as that. In 1981, we established the D.W. Brooks Awards to recognize faculty and staff of the College of Agricultural and Environmental Sciences for excellence in teaching, in research, extension, public service, and international programs. These winners are nominated by their peers and selected by a panel of judges and they represent some of the most noteworthy scientists and extension professionals in the college. With that is my great honor to recognize our recipients this year. Mark Van Eersel, Vince J. Dooley Professor of Horticulture and winner of the J.W. Brooks Award for Excellence in Research. Dr. Van Eersel is a nationally recognized leader in greenhouse energy efficiency and water use. He's pioneered new technologies in controlled environment growing that we have been able to dramatically reduce the amount of water and energy in that area of production. Our next recipient is Trish Moore, a professor and senior teaching fellow in the Department of Entomology and winner of the D.W. Brooks Award of Excellence in Teaching. Unfortunately, Dr. Moore is unable to be with us today. She's recognized across campus as an innovative instructor and one who has worked to open up biology to students underrepresented in the sciences and encourage them to pursue careers in STEM disciplines. Our next recipient is Alfredo Martinez Espinoza, professor in the Department of Plant Pathology and winner of the D.W. Brooks Award for Excellence in Extension. He has worked for 17 years to develop a dynamic extension and applied research program that focuses on the management of diseases of turf grass, small grains, and non-legume forages. And last but not, uh, certainly not least, Lori Purcell Bledsoe, Northwest District 4-H Program Development Coordinator and winner of the D.W. Brooks Award of Excellence in Public Service. Applause 
Dr. Bledsoe is a national leader in youth development and has expanded the number of young people served by Georgia 4-H across all of northeastern Georgia. Thank you all for what you do on a daily basis. And now for our lecture. On behalf of the University of Georgia and the College of Agricultural and Environmental Sciences, it is my great pleasure and true honor to introduce Ambassador uh, Ithran Cousin. As former Executive Director of the United Nations World Food Program, Ambassador Cousin guided the world's largest humanitarian organization with 14,000 staff serving 80 million beneficiaries in 75 countries. I hope you grasp the, the significance of that effort. Her work gave a unique insight into the challenges that face food insecure communities from around the world and into the tools that would need to be built to make a more robust and sustainable food system all around the world. As a champion of and global advocate for solutions to food insecurity and hunger, she's published numerous articles regarding agricultural development, food security, and nutrition. She's been listed on a number of important lists that includes Forbes 100 Most Powerful Women, The Fortune Most Powerful Women in Food and Drink, on Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People's List, and one of the five most powerful people on the planet by Foreign Policy Magazine. She currently serves as a distinguished fellow at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs and a visiting scholar at the Stanford University Center on Food Security and Environment. Would you please join me in welcoming our distinguished speaker to the podium. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. We can do better than that. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I want to make sure you're all still awake here. Now, to all the students sitting in the back of the room, before I start, there's seats up here in the front. Uh, let me invite you to come up to the front. Uh, you came here. You're going to listen to me for the next 30 or so minutes. And so take full advantage of it. Come on up. Uh, no brave souls. Oh, no brave souls. Well, Dean Pardue, thank you very much for this opportunity to join you in this very auspicious occasion. And to all the winners of the D.W. Brooks Award, congratulations to each one of you. Uh, the excellence in teaching, the extension work that you do, uh, are all the tools that we need to continue to build, not just the, <clears throat> the advocacy work that is required to support our farmers today, but the excellence that is required to ensure that we are working to develop the students who can lead us in the changes that are required for tomorrow. So thank you all very much, and again, congratulations to each one of you. Let me start by asking you a question. How many of you here are familiar with the Green Revolution? Oh, that makes me so excited. OK. <laughs> All right. So how many of you who are familiar with the Green Revolution also think it was a good thing? Yes, you are right. Across Asia and Latin America, the Green Revolution moved some 800 million people out of global poverty and hunger. Norman Borlaug, who was an American biologist, created a dwarf variety of wheat for which he received the Nobel Prize. And Peter Jennings developed a fast-growing, high-yielding strain of rice. And together, Borlaug and Jennings led a movement that transformed global agriculture. Through selective breeding, introducing new reed and rice seeds, access accessing fresh water and supplies, and, and, and supported by chemical inputs from 1960s to the 1990s. Now I'm going to test myself and see if I can do this. Um, yes. 
From 1960 to the 1990, yields of rice and wheat doubled, poverty was reduced by half, and average Asians consumed 35% more calories. These same or similar industrial farming practices across Europe and the United States, as you all know, produce ever more efficient, calorie-rich grains, particularly rice, wheat, and corn. And these grains now comprise some 60% of our global diet. But the reality is there was a downside to the Green Revolution. And the downside to the development of the industrial system of farming. Because the industrial system of farming combined with increasing global climate variability now results in food systems failures. I hear your thoughts. The global food systems provides enough food to feed everyone on the planet. That is always one of the first questions that I get. But the reality is, while this system is productive, it is not sustainable. Today, our global food system is broken. And our global food system is broken because and it is at the, that, that food system is at the heart of our global human health and planetary health crisis. Yes, our food system is productive, particularly here in the United States. And since the 1960s, the global food system has made steady yet tremendous progress in improving food security and nutrition, the increase in varietals, and the resulting increases in agricultural yield lifted millions, as I said, up from poverty and hunger. The access to seeds and fertilizers and irrigations created productive, even, if, even efficient food systems. And we've made progress on undernutrition. And with the prevalence of child stunting dropping from 40% to 23% between 1990 and 2015. But zero hunger <clears throat> or food secure world requires a sustainable and productive food system. And the Food and Agriculture Organization defines a, <clears throat> a food system as the activities which embrace the entire agricultural value, value chain that relate to the production, processing, distribution, preparation, consumption, and disposal of food. Too often, these food systems are referred to, this system is referred to as sustainable, without understanding the distinction between a productive food system and a sustainable food system. We need both. And FAO warns us that a sustainable food system must deliver food security for all in such a way that the economic and social basis to generate food security and nutrition for future generations are not compromised. People, planet, and profit are the three-legged stools of a sustainable food system. It is not enough if the food system generates, ad, ad, <coughs> generates adequate production, adequate food, or even adequate profits if the food system detrimentally impacts the environment, the people, or our future. And today, <coughs> Climate scientists are warning that food system breakdown is the biz biggest threat from climate change. And that the broken food system is at the heart of our global planetary health and environmental crisis. While I am not suggesting that agriculture is the sole cause of our climate challenges, of course not. But the reality is agriculture is a victim of and a contributor to climate change, creating an <clears throat> what some would call an inextricable paradox. But what does this mean? <clears throat> Food system activities, <clears throat> excuse me, are a major contributor to environmental impact in terms of environmental impact in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. Forty percent of all the greenhouse gas emissions come from our agriculture system. Whenever I say this in the United States, the Farm Bureau leaders always say, not here. We are much more efficient than that. 
But yes, we are making progress on the emission of greenhouse gases, particularly by cows. And those of you, you know, who are in the livestock business know that greenhouse gas from cows come from belching, and we're doing things with feed and, and, um, and the rotation of, of, um, of, of, of cattle in, in a manner that is a beginning to address the greenhouse gas emission problem. But uh, globally, the numbers are, are, the data doesn't support a it, running from this number. 40% of greenhouse gases are emitted from our agriculture system throughout the, throughout the entire value chain. Our increasing global population also requires ever-growing increases in yields, resulting in ever-increasing expansion of cultivated land. Some would suggest that to meet the population demands for food by 2050, which is, is we, we, the projection is that we will need to double the amount of food that we produce, that on, using the same methods of agricultural production that we use today, we would need to expand land under cultivation to an area the size of two Indias. And that means reduction in forests. It means <clears throat> re, uh, reduction in, in biodiversity and continuous impact on the environment. Fresh water use. 70% of the fresh water is consumed by the food system. Not just by what we do on farms, but how we process food, how we wash food, how we cook food. We, 70% of all of the fresh water is consumed through our food system. And both nitrogen and phosphorus cycles from production are also impacted by the expensive and potentially, they also impact and, and potentially irreversibly uh, challenge our environment. And on the human side, the global food system is struggling to deliver nutritious, healthy diets in an equitable manner. After a period of prolonged decline, world hunger is again for the third year in a row on the increase, with this year FAO reporting 830 million people now food insecure, and 150 million chronically malnourished children. I said that the number of malnourished children, in the early, earlier in my remarks, I stated that the number of malnourished children had been reduced as a percentage in the last 50 years. That number has not decreased, this 150 million number, since 2009. Physically, and those children who are chronically malnourished, particularly those who are malnourished during the first thousand days, we, the, their, the impact on their physical development results in both physical and mental stunting that is irreversible. In addition to the 830 million food insecure and the children who suffer from, from undernutrition. There's some three billion people. What, let, before I get to that, let me point out something on this picture. You see these children with orange hair? Children of, with melanin in their skin don't have yellow and orange hair. That is a sign of malnutrition and micronutrient deficiency. And all over sub-Saharan Africa, you see ch children, happy children just like these, with the, carrying the symbols of chronic stunting that you know they will bear for the balance of their lives. But while we are addressing these issues related to our food system not meeting the, nu the nutritional needs of, of these chronically undernourished, we are now seeing an increase in the number of obese, with some three billion 
people uh, suffering from overweight and obesity. And in the United States, 160 million Americans are obese and overweight. And this translates in two to two thirds of all men and 60% of all women. And the prevalence of obesity in our children increases on an annual basis in every age category. For example, in adolescence, from those from 12 to 19 years of age, in the past 10 years, we have seen an increase from 6.1% to 18.4% of the children suffering from obesity. These numbers translate into increases in non-communicable diseases, asthma, heart, to be, heart disease, and diabetes. And the global financial impact of overweight and obesity and the failure of our food system to provide access to the nutritious food is estimated at approximately $2 trillion. And let me ask you a question. How much do you think diabetes cost us here in the United States this year? Throw out some numbers. $10 billion, I hear. I hear another number, $10 billion. Anybody else have an idea? A hundred billion, okay. In reality, annually, diabetes now cost us $327 billion and increases every year. And also, FAO also calculates on an annual basis one third of the food produced across the globe, approximately 1.3 billion tons, gets lost or wasted. <clears throat> In the global south, food waste totals about $310 billion. And when I was at the World Food Program, I shared with the dean and his, and his team this morning that, um, that a quarter of all the food that is harvested in sub-Saharan Africa is lost through poor post-harvest handling. That's more, that totals more food than all the food that we would bring the global community as well as the governments in each of the countries provide for food aid on an annual basis. 310 billion pounds. And the primary results, the, the food loss primary re results from the lack of storage, poor transport, inadequate post-harvest handling. And in the global north, the food system waste primarily happens at retail and consumer level. And the retail and consumer food waste totals approximately $680 billion a year. In the US, 40% of all produce purchased by consumers is thrown away. And the data suggests if global food waste was a country, it would be the largest emitter of greenhouse gases after the US and China. And as acute as these challenges are, food systems are uniquely positioned to reverse course to become the primary driver of improved human and environmental health. I wouldn't be here today if it was all about the problems. I want to talk about the solutions. But those solutions and reversing course will require farm to fork food system improvement. A recent Rockefeller Lancet study found improving the food system will require research and innovation, governance and policy changes, as well as imagination. And I would add two more requirements, adequate financing and collective multi-sectoral action. But let's start with research and innovation. Increasing yields without increasing cultivated acreage will require increased 
plant research and innovation. And I hope I'm preaching to the saved when I'm here in this College of Agriculture environment talking about the need for additional seed research on seed varietals, including manipulating plant genes for traits, including drought tolerant and drought resistance. Um, there are so many different examples that I could give of the different types of research that is happening in this area. I've gotten excited about one in particular, where the, 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 how many uh, agriculture majors do we have here? Agricultural science. All right. So what I'm going to say is, is uh, you'll you'll correct me if I'm wrong. That. For example, some plants, including rice, wheat, and, and rice and wheat, produce a three-carbon compound photosynthesis when sunlight is absorbed, and it's known as C3. Other plants, including corn and sugarcane, produce a four-carbon compound photosynthesis, requiring four-compound photosynthesis requires far less water and have typically produced greater yields. Imagine, researchers are now manipulating the genes in rice to create a C4 photosynthesis, increasing the yields and making rice more drought tolerant. The challenge of creating C4 photosynthesis requires manipulating of multiple rather than one gene, which is what the, the Borlaug did and, and, and Jennings did. It was just one gene, now we're looking at multiple genes to drive the traits that are necessary to move to move these plants from C3 to C4. And any of you who are plant researchers know this is not easy. But as we were talking about earlier, one of my favorite pre oh, President Obama saying was that hard things are hard. So scientists predict this research will require 15 years of study. We're now in year four. The good news, though, is, is when, not if, these scientists successfully complete this work, the results of this research could enhance productivity of potatoes, wheat, rice, and other C3 plants. I get excited about that kind of thing. Okay, I'm a nerd, fine. But the research for seed improvements make farming more productive and resilient while addressing, potentially addressing nutrition outcomes. With research and innovation, we can also create a productive farm system that is more mindful of the landscape and ecological resources, particularly water. For example, yield enhancing conservation technologies, such as remote sensing, could address the challenges of over irrigation, which is one of the blind spots from the Green Revolution. We are now seeing droughts in parts of India because of how water is used in the industrial production of crops. So the technology could help us overcome those challenges. Precision agriculture, innovative fertilizers, as well as pesticides, as well as regenerative and no-tillage planting to protect the soils. I can, the list goes on. They've all demonstrated measurable impacts on productivity while more efficiently using natural resources. So research and innovation, including alternative proteins, such as lab-grown meats, have been shown to reduce agricultural greenhouse gas emissions and natural resource use. Big data and analytics lower the transaction costs and mitigate risk for farmers. And blockchain, blockchain technology enables traceability and transparency along the food system, along the entire food value system. And finally, food waste reduction will require research and innovation as well as research on how we change consumer behavior and then implementation of that research. 
We need more life-extending tools for foods. Like a product that I've been working with, this company called iFoods, which has created a new box and a new packaging system with a sachet included in the box, which this tool significantly slows the ripening of the food, of the produce, and reduces transport costs and losses, and increases the product shelf life by almost 14 to 21 days. So whether we're talking about seeds or research along the value chain, the positive results from pilots and small proof of concept activities across each of these innovations, from gene editing to blockchain, suggest measurable positive impacts across the food system on the availability and access to more nutritious food, while also delivering a measurable impact on the conservation, maintenance, and utilization of biological resources. And as a result, creating a positive impact on planetary health. Yet, the data also indicates the need for consideration and further research of the unintended negative impacts and trade-offs and blind spots that these new tools may create. On the off, for example, on the off farm, on the off farm neighboring rural communities, or on the employment of farmers when we substitute pro to meat protein with plant protein, and even on potential unanticipated environmental impacts. Delivering the requisite food system improvements will require more research, technology, and innovation across the board. Second, the data gathered to date demonstrates positive effective movement doesn't happen without collective action. Research alone, innovation alone, new tools alone won't make the change that is necessary. Collective action from governments, the private sector, civil society, as well as consumers. No one actor working siloed will resolve the complex food system climate enigma. Each sector must recognize and encourage whenever reasonably possible, and whenever reasonably possible, collaborate, if not coordinate, with the actions as well as the investment of other sectors. I talked to a leader of the Farmers Cooperative in Bolivia. He told me at any given time, there are 600 NGOs working in the agriculture space in Bolivia. All of them working on their siloed activities, all of them working in their different ways with government, and many of them working with the same farmers and uncoordinated. And we wonder why progress doesn't happen. Collective action enhances the success potential of the Lancet suggested pillars for the effectively addressing the healthy food, healthy planet challenge. And for example, government policies, while critical, must be, of course, supported by research and data. Yet, the effectiveness of any government policy is directly related to support from an adoption by civil society, the private sector, and the benefit of those policies to consumers. And the private sector is a key partner in developing, testing, and rapidly scaling innovative solutions across all aspects of the food systems. New approaches are already bringing significant change in digital tools to help farmers secure financing and to connect market, agricultural inputs that boost production, innovative food products that enhance nutrition and extend shelf life, and technologies for improved storage and traceability to improve supply chain traceability. But when we think about harnessing the power of the private sector and innovation, we must not overlook <clears throat> one of the largest and most important private sector actors, and you heard this from D.W. Brooks, the farmers. 
with adequate investment, farmers, whether in the developed or developing world, will deliver the innovation required to sustainably produce the 50% increased yields necessary to meet the projected 2050 global population food demands. In many areas, the majority of these farmers are women. And these farmers and rural entrepreneurs are often innovators as well as producers of food. For example, in Abuja, Nigeria, farmers selling tomatoes in the local market today discard their leftover produce at the end of the day because they lack storage, cold storage, to preserve it, even for market sales the next day. A woman entrepreneur named Oliani developed a small-scale cold storage unit using renewable solar energy and digital technology and began marketing them through these tools through a startup. But she's struggling to attract financing from investors who are wary of high-risk markets and untested women entrepreneurs working in a marketplace. This financing problem extends to established companies as well in the food and agriculture sector. And it extends to farmers here at home. In southern Mississippi, I talked with young farmers renting farmland. We talked about this this morning. Um, because of the, the unavailability of investment capital to support the purchase of farmland. Practicing regenerative agriculture while of interest to these farmers who are renting is outside their economic bandwidth. And for farmers at home and abroad, increased financing with longer time for return, reasonable times for return, will increase farmer adaptation of sustainable agricultural methods as well as enhance the potential for high impact solutions to develop to scale. And scaling requires adequately financed private sector market-based actions, not just government subsidies, particularly in communities most heavily affected by poor nutrition, poverty, and impacted by climate. The most vulnerable people, whether in the, in, in the US or or in developing countries, the poorest and most vulnerable farmers live on the most climate vulnerable land. Consumer demand may drive the farmer level production changes because farmers will plant wood cells. However, government policies, including subsidies and incentives, will determine plant research, the crops planted, consumer access, affordability, and in many places, whether the private sector will allow for the free flow of information, goods, and products. And the data suggests governments across the global north and south must address the governance and policy issues negatively impacting our food system, including that controversial issue of a revision or of our commodity programs and subsidies even here at home. I, I can get run out of rooms like this. <laughs> if you talk about reducing subsidies for nutrient poor foods while converting those funds to investments for what are commonly called, what are called in our farm bill, specialty crops, such as fruits and vegetables, as well as to support, there is money in the farm bill to support conservation, but it's tiny. And so increasing support for conservation practices in agriculture and for better water management. We look at the water challenges in places like Rio, Mexico, and South Africa. You can look in the Colorado area as in, and the Midwest and see similar challenges beginning today with larger problems looming on the horizons. 
The reality is that subsidies for agricultural inputs can also lead to overuse of inputs and natural resources, exacerbating land degradation and emitting more greenhouse gases. Government subsidies should be better targeted so they have greater returns in terms of economic efficiency, nutrition, and natural resource use, or that they could provide direct income or productive support for vulnerable groups, including smallholders, women, and young farmers. Because whether domestic subsidies or subsidies in developing countries, the large bulk of subsidies go to larger farmers and not to smaller, younger farmers. And I know I'm going to stop there on that one because <laughs> that's a lecture in and of itself. A number of agriculture and food scientists, as well as some noted economists, and this is another one of those touchy subjects, are also suggesting that taxing emission intensive foods, such as meat, could reduce greenhouse gas emissions and the use of natural resources and avoid hundreds of thousands of deaths. Because these, they, they argue these foods are associated with dietary and weight related risk factors. Last year, at a climate gathering in Stockholm, several experts cautioned such taxes should only be considered for wealthy countries where daily meat consumption exceeds recommended daily amounts. And governments making these, these and other difficult decisions must consider the trade-offs. I am not making a suggestion here. I am just providing you with data. <laughs> There, because there could be a large number of trade-offs that are difficult to compare. As a result, any policy decision will require a multifaceted, science-based approach for measuring and weighing the various consequences of any action. And despite the controversy, a growing body of data encourages policy development aimed at shifting to more plant-based diets, which the data suggests could reduce greenhouse gases caused by food production by 70% between now and 2050. But any food consumption policy must be evidence-based and empirically grounded. If you don't get anything else from my lecture today, I hope that comes through. And even because even then, making these types of ma mammoth changes will not be easy. A recent British study of 2,000 adults identified resident, relatively good public knowledge of climate change and the impact of the food system on the environment. Even with this, four in five of those surveyed stated they would change their diets to improve their health. Less than half said they would change their diet to reduce the impact on the environment. Advocates also caution, however, that widespread adoption of these policies will not only be challenging, but they will have consequences especially for the agriculture in in industry, which must be factored into any policy shifts. We must, any shift towards less animal products and more vegetables could leave certain farmers in a lurch unless policies and incentives were in place to support farmers looking to shift towards different, or different crops or specialty crops, as well as increasing the opportunity for export of more animal protein to places where there are animal protein deficiencies, which gets me right into trade. And to provide opportunities for additional trade, international trade rules established under the auspices of the World Trade Organization and newer mechanisms created under the Paris Agreement aimed at responding to climate change must be mutually supported. To achieve this global policy objective, national agricultural trade policies may need to be readjusted to help transform the global marketplace into a pillar 
of food security and a tool for climate change adaptation. Moving food to where it's needed without moving food to places where we distort the agriculture systems and the food systems in those countries. And the, why is this important? Because to prevent economic and food security gaps between developed and developing countries from widening even further, we must ensure that the evolution and expansion of agricultural trade is equitable. And then it works for the elimination of hunger, food security, and malnutrition, as well as providing an economic export opportunity. Yes, international trade has the potential to stabilize markets and reallocate food from surplus to deficit regions, helping countries adapt to climate change and contribute to food security. For example, in South Africa this past year, South Africa is traditionally a maize exporting country. Because of droughts in the country this year, and they, they imported large amounts of maize. Positive trade between countries to support food security as well as economic opportunity. The uneven impact of climate change across the world and its implications for agricultural trade, especially for developing countries, underline the need for a balanced approach to policies which should enhance the adaptive role of trade while supporting the food security needs of low income and vulnerable. Before closing, while the pillars I have addressed are all essential research, technology, innovation, collective action, government policies, including trade and adequate finance, effectively address the, are what the tools that we need to effectively address the human health and planetary health enigma. None of these pillars will achieve this audacious goal if we do not overcome the challenges and ensure opportunities for gender equity. Women comprise 43% of the global agricultural labor force and up to 50% in Eastern and Southeastern Asia and across Sub-Saharan Africa. Yet in most countries, they lack equal access to the training, capital, and inputs. And numerous studies, including the UN's recent SOFI report, show rural women are often more vulnerable than men to climate shocks. They lack the resilience and the, 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 the social safety net support and the financial support systems. But given the right support, that women can significantly boost agricultural yields, reduce post-harvest losses, and help make farming more resilient, making gender equity another essential pillar. As I close, I ask, do we as individuals lack the empathy or the imagination to deliver the changes required to create planetary health and an environment, environmentally sustainable food system supporting healthy diets. Humanity lives in one atmosphere. And we all must act decisively and collectively to, pre to preserve the common and finite resources of land, sea, air, biodiversity, and fresh water necessary for health, for human health, and planetary health. What good science and substantial data tell us is if we do nothing, change little or not enough, if we fail to adequately invest, if we ignore the challenges outside our own borders, we are headed towards a future that even in the most creative, dystopian future is hard to contemplate. The past four years have been the hottest on record. Coral reefs are dying and sea levels are rising. Winter temperatures in the Arctic have risen by three degrees since 1990. 
Climate change challenges us to look ahead, to look past our lives, to consider how the future might look for generations to come, and where we end up clearly depends on what we do now. The point is, the choices we make now may lead to a better or worse potential future. 98% of all the future stories written today are dystopian. But past experience demonstrates it is possible to make decisions, hard decisions, which make the world more kind and just. In 1959, the Ford Foundation convened a meeting of noted economists and agricultural scientists. And one of the noted economists predicted, at best, the world's outlook is grave. At worst, it is frightening. Another predicted that famines, especially in India, would kill millions in the 1970s and 1980s. The Green Revolution and making the hard choices and the difficult, substantial investments overcame those grim visions by transforming global agriculture. And as a result today, even in the most fragile states, almost all infants live to adulthood. There is nothing shameful, unrealistic, or naive about wanting a better world. Creating a future world with a global food system that universally delivers human health and supports our planetary health is possible and achievable. You still say it's impossible. Nelson Mandela always said, it always seems impossible until it is done. Getting it done requires acting collectively and universally at every level, global, national, and local. But it must begin with each one of us overcoming our personal fears our personal xenophobia, our own personal resistance to change, recognizing the truth of the scientific data, and committing to individual as well as collective action. So I ask, what will you do to create utopia and not dystopia? Thank you. my last slide, it didn't come up, I didn't look over there. My babies, <laughs> <laughs> they, they go up, oh good. <laughs> so we now have an opportunity for some questions. For those of you who are here in the audience, we've got mics on uh, both aisles, and if you are viewing remotely, ask your moderator to type your question into the chat function. So uh, this has never been a shy group, so I wonder do we have any questions for the ambassador? Yes. Hello. Um, of course, this is a very, very serious problem, and uh, the numbers are frightening. But we also have very good numbers here in the United States. Um, because our productivity and our efficiency is increasing all the time in this country, mm -hmm. it allowed uh, the country to have more forests, uh, change the land use. So now we have a 2% net carbon sink in the United States. Mm -hmm. Agriculture, forestry, and land use, we are 2% carbon sink, not carbon emissions, carbon sink. So I think there is a lesson there to be learned. Mm -hmm. um, the, the picture in the rest of the world isn't as good as this. Agriculture and elsewhere, plus land uses, go up to 29% or something. I don't think it's 40, but 29%. So 
what lessons can be learned and what can we teach as the country that probably has the best agriculture in the world to developing countries? Well, thank you very much for that question. Um, the U.S., and I had the privilege of representing the U.S. in the Food and Agriculture Organization, which is the leading organization for developing policies related to food and agriculture, has always served as a leader on agricultural practices and agricultural training. The extension services, the international land grant universities and the work with developing countries has historically been the change maker in particularly in developing countries, but also even in, in the sharing of information between farmers in the United States and Europe, Asia, and, and uh, of course in Latin America. The, we are seeing a, a and, and this is not a political statement, it's just a statement of fact, we are seeing a reduction in U.S. investment in trans information transfers uh, from our, whether it is from our academic institutions or through our government programs into developing countries. Um, China committed to educating a thousand agricultural uh, scientists every year. Um, five years ago, and they are, they are achieving that commitment. Um, they they um, are investing in, in roads and, uh, and agriculture value chain supports across the continent. Uh, the Belt and Road Initiative, um, they are increasing their investment in uh, information exchanges uh, with countries across Asia and now moving more in, into Latin America. This is an area of U.S. leadership that I have been advocating we must not abdicate. Um, you are absolutely right. There are many lessons that we have, we've learned and that we have that we've implemented here in our country that we must share with the world. But I would also say that our our progress, even here in the United States, has not been uniform. Um, it, it is, we have many of our, our young farmers, our, our poor farmers, who are not um, practicing the type of agriculture that results in the type of outputs that you've just described. And we need to provide the incentives that are necessary to support the adoption of those new agricultural practices by our farmers universally here in our own country as well. Yes, uh, good afternoon and thank you very much for your uh, lecture. Um, my name is uh, Leo Lombardini. I'm the head of the horticulture department here at the University of Georgia. Before coming to Georgia, I was associated with the Norman Borlaug Institute mm -hmm. for International Agriculture at Texas A&M University. So obviously, when you mentioned Dr. Borlaug, uh, that, that touched a chord. Uh, I have a, que a simple question for you. Um, when you give a presentation like this, or when you talk about these topics uh, to members of the current uh, Trump administration, what kind of response do you get? Because it seems that a lot of the uh, topics you touch don't really align to be uh, politically correct with uh, their vision. Uh, in all honesty, I have not been asked to speak by the Trump administration and the okay, leadership that answered the Trump my administration. Question. The, the good news is that I am still very much uh, in conversation with members of Congress on both sides of the aisle. Um, and much of the work, whether it's in um, our continued support for food assistance, uh, as well as agricultural development and the, um, and the, the passage of the extension of the, the Obama farm projects, was a bipartisan effort. And the, we were talking earlier and I was saying that hunger and agriculture have always been bipartisan issues on the Hill. Um, but last year was the first time that we passed a farm bill that left, that left the House with only Republican votes. Um, and they ref there was a refusal to compromise on issues that the Democrats wanted. And it wasn't until the Senate passed a bill 
that uh, did address many of those issues that in conference we were able to create a bipartisan um, solution that resulted in uh, a not bad farm bill. We still have a lot of work to do. But the, what, I, what I am always very careful about is that I do not make this a partisan issue. We cannot afford to have this issue become part of the partisan debate in our country today. It is too critical to not only our future prosperity, but our, 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 our as, as I said from the, the title of the, of the lecture, to our human health and our planetary health. Hello, uh, my name is Quinn Webb. I'm a fourth year environmental econ student in the College of Ag. Um, my come question. Up, come up, come up, come up. Why, why? <laughs> okay, there you go. Um, my question to you uh, I'm interested to hear your thoughts on monopoly power in at the agricultural industry, um, specifically like companies like Monsanto that have um, like many patents on seeds and uh, other uh, resources that, you know, uh, it, it, it kind of blocks innovation in this, in, in the agricultural space because other startups that may want to patent their own seeds are, you know, they're faced with this large corporation with virtually unlimited resources, especially now with their uh, merger with Bayer. Um, I'm interested to hear like what your thoughts are on solving that issue. Yeah, okay. So who doesn't know that I'm now on the Bayer board? <laughs> Uh, and uh, Monsanto, as, as you noted, is, is, has, was, was purchased by and merged into, to, into Bayer. And uh, I went on the Bayer board because the, um, the chair of the board said to me that they want to support sustainability. And they want to use, they have some, Bayer has more, and Monsanto first, and now Bayer, with the combination with Monsanto, has more of the science in, in their institution, in their organization, that we need to address many of the challenges that we've been discussing here today. And I asked the question of, will I be hurt if I am on the board? And they said, that is why we came to you because we want someone who has credibility in the community and who is willing to help us help the world because we want to be a part of the solution. And so I'm taking them at their word. I haven't been to my first board meeting yet. This is all brand new, but I'm excited that they reached out to someone like me to say we want to work differently and we want to become part of the solution. So, Eyes open, let's keep a watch on me, keep me honest. Send me a, 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 a nasty text on, on, uh, on, on Instagram or Facebook, uh, Facebook if you think I'm not doing enough. Um, because I, I do believe that we need the science that is in the large ad companies, whether it's Corteva or, um, or Bayer or, um, or Syngenta or Kemen, any of them, we need, um, we need them as part of the solution. I think we've got a question remotely. We have a question from our Griffin audience. Uh, 11,000 scientists recently pinpointed human population growth as a driver of the climate crisis. What are your thoughts on that? I knew somebody was going to ask that question. I, I always get the question, well, what if we don't go to nine and a half to 10 billion people? I said, all the better. But our, the, we, the, the, the growth in population is not occurring here. It is occurring primarily in, in, in Asia and Africa. And the projections suggest that by 2050, 85% of the global population will live in um, Asia, Africa, and Latin America. And as we talked about earlier today, Nigeria will exceed the United States in population by 2030. And as of 2020, 1 million uh, sub-Saharan African youth will turn 18 every year. And we are not investing 
in the in the either the 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 health practices or the contraceptive tools that will address these population issues. We can't wish them away. And so if we recognize that that is a challenge, we need to invest in the behavior change and the, the tools that are necessary, we know what they are, to support women's ability to make the choices to address their family uh, planning issues. And if we don't, we will have nine and a half billion people by 2050. Amen. <laughs> and that's another reason that I, I said yes to the Bayer board, because as you know, Bayer is, is the crop science, it's, it's, science, it's ag and it's health. And they, have, they are also investing in, in uh, women's health issues and they have a significant commitment to uh, addressing access to, to uh, family, family planning tools for women across the globe over the next 20 years to help us to be a part, to, to, they want to serve as a leader in that goal of the sustainable de development goal as well. And it's only if we are willing, from a private sector standpoint, as well as government standpoint, to make the investments in these different, uh, both the tools and the education that is necessary, that we will not reach that number. I'll stop there. I get carried away. Because everybody says, OK, we just don't, let's not, let's, let's we, we need to address the, the, the challenge of population. Yeah, we do. OK. We've just talked about what's necessary. I could give another lecture on what we, what's required on that. <laughs> Moving on. Next. Good afternoon. My name is Narki Norton. I have the pleasure of serving as the program coordinator in the Office of Diversity Affairs within the College of Ag and Environmental Science. I also serve as a national officer in manners, minorities in agriculture, natural resources, and related science. So my question for you, you have an extremely amazing background. You've been all over the world. How do we convince everyday people to care about or buy into planetary health, especially since everyone here has the privilege of being in academia, and sometimes that can be a gap to connecting to everyday folks. So from your experience, what can you advise us as people who represent mm -hmm. in academia or also in industry, how we connect on what planetary health is and why it matters, especially for those who are not convinced um, or who are not directly impacted from the stressors of planetary health. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate that question. The reality of it is you're never going to convince everybody that we need to move in a particular direction. And merely because we can't convince everybody should not limit our ability to convince those that we can and to move, continue to move forward. I get really excited when you get young people demanding that the universities and restaurants um, eliminate the use of plastic straws for paper straws. We're not going to make the, cha the changes in our, in our oceans that we need because we went from plastic straws to paper straws. But what we do is increase awareness of the challenges of our ocean and that it does take action and, 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 and demand for change to make those changes that are necessary to create environmental health. That ultimately our governments will then respond to. Governments respond when citizens demand action. And citizens responds when they are given information and they, are, they begin to understand the impacts of failure to act on their own personal well-being and particularly as they grow older on the, their children and their grandchildren. I, I am old enough now that I am a grandmother and I can tell you it is much better than being a parent. Um, <laughs> but it also makes you ever more cognizant that I have more experiences behind me than ahead of me, and that what we do now is going to affect 
the lives of those babies that I love. And the more we can get, you know, I'm, 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 I told a friend of mine, we need to start Grandmothers for the Earth <laughs> around the world. But it's, and I say that, in, 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 and you laugh, but it's those kinds of movements that will begin to make the change. You know, how captivated by, was the world, or is the world, by one young girl who stands up and makes demands to government? And how many young people who hadn't thought about these issues before because they, she was on their social media, have begun to think about these issues. It's those kinds of drops that begin to make the change. And so I, I am all about the drops. And every audience like this that I talk to, every, every young person that I can support who wants to attend a conference and organize their friends and their friends' friends and the impact that that will have on, on what our governments and our multilateral organizations uh, continue to do to address these issues, I think is, 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 is paramount to seeing the kinds of hard changes that we need. We have one more question from our remote audience, and then we have time for this gentleman's question um, to finish up. Uh, this question comes from Toby in our remote audience. He wants to know, do you think GMO crops can help poor African countries, considering that basic best management practices are still poor in such countries? If not, what can we do? Well, uh, I represent the United States government. Did I tell you all that? <laughs> and I represented farmers here in the United States when I served as, uh, as, as U.S. ambassador. And I spent a lot of time studying uh, GMOs. And I was on the Board for International Food and Agricultural Development when Monsanto originally introduced GMOs. And I listened to them, and I, I recognized the value that this science would bring. But I asked them, what are you doing to explain this to the world? Nature abhors a vacuum. And they said, we don't need to. The world's going to embrace these changes. We'll have people knocking our doors down for this science. Well, not so fast. Not so fast. But the data continues to support the value of GMOs. And I, even when I was head of WFP, to the consternation of my European board members, would always say, let the science lead. But let the science lead with open and transparent access to information by the public at large. Answer the questions of the critics demonstrate the value. Yes, it's slower, it takes more time, but we will have the, the solving this enigma that we've been talking about here today will require a diversity of agriculture solutions. We will have organic crops and um, genetically engineered, as well as, and I, I, I would argue that we're not going to see as much GMO in the future as we have in the past because of the amount of time that it takes to bring a GMO seed to market and the cost of that. But CRISPR has given us the ability to explore the genetics of, a plant, of plants and seeds without bringing in matter from other species. Imagine that. Let the science lead, but do it openly, transparently, and in conversation with those who agree with you as well as those who disagree. This gentleman has the privilege of the last question. Thank you. Hello, um, my name's Jake Blades, and I'm a horticulture undergraduate. And I came up to build off of Quinn's question, but now I'm also gonna try to build off of that question, okay. too. Um, so, in order to 
um, make the techniques that we need to create the variation in our crops that you mentioned, like the C4 plants, you, through these techniques of you know, not only transgenics and CRISPR, but also mutagenesis, mm -hmm. um, what can be done um, in order to make those processes more efficient and cost-effective, whether it's changing public perception or um, just on the governmental regulation level. And the second component is, um, how can we make these techniques more accessible um, to people in other countries mm -hmm. so that it's not just um, uh, companies from predominantly developed nations leveraging power mm -hmm. through these patents? Okay, um, I would say it is not, it is not, is it, is it more science or uh, building awareness in, in the population? It is and, it is both of those. And it is, and the, I can't underscore and state enough the, the need for adequate financing. And financing that is long term enough that it allows us to perform the science that is necessary, but also to address the outreach and advocacy work and education work that is required to support consumer and, and constituency acceptance of that science. Um, the, 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 the opportunities that, um, that science can provide will, you are, you are absolutely right. If we do not, if we do not uh, address access to that science by developing countries, as well as the, the affluent farmers in, in developed countries, um, we will see ever-growing disparity as we are seeing increases in population. And so there are conversations going on as we speak about hosting the, the, a World Food Summit, and the Secretary General just said yes to this in 2021. Uh, and, and what many of us have argued for is not just a World Food Summit, because we've done that before, but more of a UNFCC, as we have for climate, for food that brings together the various constituencies across the food system from both an academic and, um, and, and science background, and not all science are academics, not all scientists are academics, uh, to ensure that we have uh, policies that will support universal uh, opportunity for accessing the best science and the best tools. And so after, a lot of meetings. Um, we, we, we have the first leg of that stool, which is the, a commitment to the food summit, the World Food Summit in 2021. Now we are banging on the Secretary General's door for the, a, this UNFCC for food, so stay tuned. Uh, this, because we, the, we, that is one of those, those consequences of continuing to move forward in one part of the world and not another that uh, we must uh, address before it becomes a real significant problem as we see increases in population. So thank you for that question. Uh, I think I can get by without the mic, I've been told I'm loud. Uh, we commissioned to have a piece of art done uh, in your honor. And I recognize it will not fit in the overhead bin of the plane, so, so we will ship it to you, but we did want to give you a memento of your time here. Thank you. Absolutely. Now, if I can say, if I can say very quickly, when I was here at the University of Georgia, if anyone had ever said that I would have had the career experience and the life experiences that I've been, that have been made available to me, I never would have believed them. But to all of you who are faculty here at the University of Georgia, I say thank you, because much of, many of the tools that I needed, the platform for success, came right here, came from right here at the University of Georgia. And to all you students in the audience, I say make good use of this time. If you sat through this lecture and you, and you are still here, okay? <laughs> 
that says that you're doing the right things. Embrace every opportunity to maximize the value of your time here on campus because you don't know where 40 years from now it will take you. And I'm the new one. Thank you all. Despite the, the, the metrics on the, the, the obesity, obesity, we have a reception. <laughs> 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 <laughs>